We'll now open the hearing on House Bill 77, sponsored by Representative Burleson. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Eric Burleson. I represent the 133rd District, which is in Springfield, representing the citizens of Western Springfield and the town of Battlefield. And I bring to you today, I'm honored to bring to you today House Bill 77. Um, House Bill 77 is about workplace fairness and equality. There are 24 states that are giving American families an opportunity to make a choice, and they're doing this for three main reasons. Because workers' freedom encourages job growth. Secondly, workers' freedom strengthens unions. And thirdly, workers' freedom is individual <coughs> related to job growth. Those 24 states in our union that are freedom to work states, six of those states border Missouri and have been a continuous drain on our job growth, often siphoning potential businesses across our border. This fact can also be seen in the number of jobs created. The U.S. Department of Labor shows that between 2003 and 2008, freedom to work states created jobs two and a half times faster than those states that did not have freedom to work laws. The move of Americans from closed shop states to freedom to work states is proof positive of this and is part of the reason why Missouri now has less representation in our U.S. Congress. In fact, since 2000, nearly 5 million Americans have moved to states with freedom to work laws. When converting the personal income figures for all 50 states from 1960 to 2000 and adjusting for inflation, freedom to work states have 4.1% higher per capita personal incomes than non-freedom to work states. This is according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Between 2001 and 2011, compensation in the private sector has grown in freedom to work states by 12%, while compensation has grown only by 3% in non-freedom to work states. We have to be honest with ourselves and recognize that businesses when seeking a new location often list is a high priority, the criterion that the state must be a freedom to work state. And they simply, they simply exclude states that are not so. According to research done by the National Institute for Labor Relations, Missouri's manufacturing GDP has decreased by 12.9% from 2000 to 2009, while in freedom to work states, they've had an average of 14.7% growth. Missouri can also benefit from this legislation and instead enter the business attraction market, luring jobs, investment, and increased revenue to our state instead of losing out time after time. Second reason that I mentioned why states are passing freedom to work laws has to do with the fact that freedom to work laws actually strengthen unions. Unions are more responsive and provide better services to their members when their members have a choice. Allowing workers to have the freedom to join unions will strengthen unions by giving them the drive and motivation to keep up with an ever-changing workplace which desperately needs strong organizations that are responsive to their members and empowering them to compete in the global market. There are countless associations that I work with and rep that represents the in interests of employees in this state that do not need to rely on compulsory dues. As chairman of professional registration, I often and nearly every day meet with associations that represent all interests of the state and, all, and many professions, from doctors, <coughs> nurses, cosmetologists, dentists, the list goes on. These associations represent thousands, tens of thousands of employees in the state that do not rely on compulsory dues. And because of this, these associations and countless ones like them are responsive to their members and must be relevant in order to maintain memberships. Simply put, the fact that members can leave makes these associations better. And freedom to work will make unions stronger for Missouri's hardworking employees. The third reason that many states are passing freedom to work laws is that it promotes individual freedom. 
Article 1, Section 29 of the Missouri Constitution states that employees shall have the right to organize and bargain collectively through represent representatives of their own choosing. This clearly protects and lays out the right of all Missouri workers to organize together and bargain collectively. But it also guarantees the worker the right to choose their own representative, and that representative might even just be themselves. We must work to uphold the right to join a union or join a competing union or not join one at all. This is essential in our workplace if we're going to uphold the freedoms of every hardworking Missouri taxpayer that goes to work, punches a clock, and gives of their own sweat and blood to ensure that their families fed, clothed, and have this roof over their head. And I'll close with this. John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy said that employees shall have and shall be protected in the exercise of the right freely and without fear of penalty or reprisal to form, join, and assist in an employee organization or to refrain from any such activity. Thank you. Are there any committee members that have questions for the bill sponsor? Representative Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman of Meyer. Oh, yeah. Gentlemen, so it's what you were saying, it's your intention to bring this bill forward to strengthen unions, is that correct? Yes. Interesting. Um, does your bill change the requirement that unions would have to represent every member in the workplace? They don't have to do that now. Under federal law, they're required to. They're, they do not have to do that now. They can choose to not represent that's, members that... I don't believe that's correct. And even if they do, there's associations that are today that represent members that are not members of their association. But does, does this change the, the National Labor you Relations as, Act? You as, a, you as a member of many committees, you're hearing from associations all the time that have members that choose whether or not they're going to, going to join that association. So, I mean, does this change or preempt federal law, the National Labor Relations Act, which requires that unions represent all and every member in their in the bargaining unit, regardless of whether they're status in the union or not? They, does this change that? It, it does not change federal law. Okay, so under this bill, unions would be required to represent people who would not be contributing their share towards representation. Is that correct? It, under this law, if, if a, the way that it works today is that they get the opportunity, the union gets the opportunity whether or not they're going to be a closed shop or whether they're going to be open. This would, uh, this does not change that. And they do not have to represent people that are not paying their associates. Gentlemen, under the National Labor Relations Act, unions are required to represent every member in their bargaining unit regardless of what their status is. Your bill, my understanding would be, they would not have to pay any dues for that representation. Isn't that correct? No, they do, they do not have to represent people that are not having to pay. They basically, if someone chooses to not pay, they can they can change the organization of. This contract. bill would allow people to essentially freeload. I mean, you you don't support people freeloading, do you? As a general principle, you're against people I, forcing their costs upon other people. You think everybody should pay their own? There are there are associations that 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 advocate on your behalf, on my behalf, on behalf of thousands of people that do not require those members that do not require every citizen that that it benefits to pay some form of. As a general principle, you agree people should pay their own way, pay their fair share, don't you? That that As is general different. principle. Not, they should not be forced into something that they did not agree with. As a general principle, do you think people should have to pay their own fair share, pay their own way? If someone has agreed to, and they have, and they taken a, if someone has, has asked you to do a service for them, like a bill, and you're not, and they're not going to pay the bill, that's different than than you than some than, than someone who refuses to be a part of the association. It's a pretty simple. Does not want to pay. Do you bill. believe people should pay their fair share or not? If someone has made a commitment to a contract, they should pay a bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Flint Flyer. You had mentioned about the labor relations 
you know, you're, you're quoting statistics from the Bureau of Labor Relations. And I, I mean, I'm listening to this this morning, and I, I, I want to ask you, you know, I asked you before, you know, have you consulted leadership on this bill? Like, have you talked to the speaker, Tim Jones and John Deal? Are they in favor of this bill? Well, uh, lady, you can see they've co-sponsored the bill. No, I'm serious. This is my first time looking, so they co-sponsored this bill. Okay. But the reason I'm asking that, because you're quoting statistics from the Bureau of Labor Investigations. Are you aware that those statistics in what you call freedom to work states, are you aware of the disparity between women and men in salaries in those states? It also tells you that there's a disparity that they pay men more than women because there's no contract to say that we're doing the same job and everybody gets paid the same. Are you aware of that? Lady, I, that, I'm not trying to address the issues between the genders. Well, no, that your bill, well, what you're doing is you're saying that you're quoting statistics that support, you know, freedom to work states. But I want to also have you to quote the statistics that show that there's a disparity between women and men according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And there's also a disparity in those states between African Americans and whites. So what you're doing in your bill, you're saying that, okay, we're getting ready to eliminate, you know, the contract between employer and employee. This is a contract that's negotiated where everybody is on the same playing field when they negotiate the contract. So I'm just asking, are you aware of those statistics as well? I'm I have not, do you have those statistics available? I don't, I've not I mean, seen I can go to the statistics. Bureau of Labor Investigations website and give them to you. Because, you know, I, at the end, there's, there's several reasons. I gave three reasons why this support, why states have, have done this. It, at the end of the day, uh, what I think is more important is job abundance. And, and there's certainly situations where people may, um, may have a difficult time finding a job, but I would think that I would, if I were in that situation, if I were uh, a group of, that was try, having a hard time finding a job, I would want to be in a state that has an abundance of opportunities. Okay. And that the statistics clearly show that freedom to work states have an abundance of job opportunities compared to non-freedom to work states. Well, I'm asking you this. In those freedom to work states, are you also showing your three examples of why it's important they're also extenuating examples why it's not a good idea. So just like the ones that I've mentioned, the disparity between African Americans and whites, you know, with labor unions in labor and states where you have organized contracts between employer and employee, you eliminate that. You eliminate the disparity between women and men. You eliminate that. So that's also one of the reasons. And then also you keep talking about choice. You have the freedom to join or not join a union. I mean, I have the freedom to join or not join a union. So I'm not sure, you know, when you say choice, I'm not aware of what are you saying there. Is that a question? It is. You, you, may, have the, you may have the choice to not join the union. However, you do not have the choice to pay association fees. And those association fees are more often than not the same as the union dues. And so... That is, in most people's mind, is not a choice. Okay. Well, if you're if you're joining a company where the wages and health care and all of that has has a contract, you're joining a company. See, you have the freedom to not work at that place because if you're going somewhere where the employees, 51 percent or more of the employees have said that we want to negotiate our wages and our health care with the employer. The employer has entered into this agreement with them, 51%. I'm going to tell you, Missouri wasn't for Obama, but do you think they got a choice of who their president is right now? You get me? The majority of the people voted him in office, so the other percentage that did not vote him in office doesn't have a choice of who their president is right now. So if you come to a place where over 51% of the employees have negotiated a contract for their wages and their salaries, why wouldn't you want to pay your fair share? I mean, you wouldn't get this salary of wages if they hadn't negotiated it. That's all I'm saying. That's why I say, have you researched this? Have you done the work? 
on the laws. The pros and the cons, not just the ones that support your ideology. Lady, this, this is working in 24 other states. And in those 24 other states, they're seeing a flight of industries move into those states. Those states are seeing job abundance. And in, within this state, we, we, have, uh, we have businesses that are not closed. We have businesses where this is available today. Um, and so they're seeing job abundance at what cost? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Um, you know, I was going through, I, I think we can, you know, I don't want to retread the prior inquiry, but it seems to me there are statistics we can cite for various things. And there's probably statistics on, you know, maybe on both sides. But have you, I guess what the, the point of the inquiry uh, of the prior conversation uh, is the impact, the disparate impact on certain populations of the law. Have you looked at, for instance, Oklahoma as, a, as an example? That's a neighbor to our state. Have, are you aware of the statistics on job growth there? I can give you statistics on job growth amongst the 24 versus the rest of the states, but I don't have statistics specifically on, on individual states. I mean, I, I saw a statistic saying that Oklahoma had like one third drop in job growth pretty recently after passing this. Um, I think the point is, though, that isn't it that people move I, for a variety of reasons? I, I think I mean, that there there are, and I think that as when you're looking at data, you can't go, you you shouldn't go off of just one anecdote of one state. But we often talk about this when it relates to fair tax and people's people will refer to Florida or other states. And, and say you can't use those states because because people move there for different reasons and I would I would agree with that people move to different states and sometimes job growth occurs in different states and you can't use one state you can't compare Missouri to Florida for example but when you look at when you when you take all of the states combined and then then the picture starts to come together and, and at that point you can you can be more clear about about the differences. Are there other inquiries from the I think, gentlemen, can I continue? I'm sorry, I was just interrupted by the noise back there. Um, as far as as far as wages though, though go, I mean, we've seen statistics that show that that's pushed down when right to work is passed. Um, the one of the things that that I found interesting about that, and I was, at, when, it, when I was researching this at first, I thought that that, was, that may have been the case. Because when you look at the data on its face, the states that, have, that are right to work states are, un, in my opinion, unquestionably have lower unemployment rates. They have, the, there's a lot more job growth in those states. And you, on its face, it seems that those, but the right to work states or the freedom work states, that the, in those states, the, the wages are lower. However, if you look at the acceleration of, of salaries in those states, they are accelerating at a much faster rate. And the only, the, what, what makes sense is when you realize that the non-right-to-work states are on the coast, which have a much higher standard of living, much higher cost of living, and they have much higher salaries. So well, most of the freedom-to-work states are in the Midwest. And and the, the cost of living in these states and the salaries in these states in the Midwest are, yeah, are I, at this point are at this point lower and regardless. So the question is, what do we want to be in a state where the salaries are growing faster or they're stagnant? And and that's what Well and, and gentlemen, I mean, the data I saw actually showed this in state wages going down and the reason was you were attracting labor from outside that state. Because once you deregulate, or actually, I mean, I look at this as actually state regulation of private contracts. I mean, that's what this is. It's a mandate on who can enter into contracts. 
who can enter into labor negotiations? And that kind of goes to your third point, which is individual freedom. I mean, isn't it? I mean, there's a constitutional right to enter into contracts, isn't there not? I mean, it's in our U.S. Constitution. And how does this, how do you uh, it's, it's propose also a constitutional right of association? Well, and, and, you know, I guess we're looking at regulating, though, the right of private parties that enter into contracts. Isn't that true? We're, we are allowing an individual the right to associate, the right to, to join a union or not to join. We're telling, though, this group of employees and employers that they can't enter into certain types of contracts. And if we tell this group that they can't enter into that contract, I guess my question for you is, what's the next group? Who are we going to go to next if, and say they can't enter into that contract? There's nothing to say they can't enter into that contract. What it says is that if they want to enter that contract, they cannot collect the, the dues from... That's a term of the them. contract, though. That's a critical term of the contract that would lead to this freeloader issue that we're talking about, isn't it? Well, the, the, and there is potentially, I, I see, the problem is that, is that the fundamental right of an individual to choose whom they associate is, in my opinion, is, is, is more important than, than creating a scenario where you're forcing someone to, to enter into a, a group that they do not wish to associate. Yeah, I just see, I guess, the flip side is we're forcing a certain kind of contract, uh, and we're barring a certain type of contract. We're, we're actually by law, state law, saying you cannot have that, and we're mandating it. From the top down. The, the, it does not say that they can't have that contract. It just says that they cannot force. They can't have the critical term that they currently have they, right now they cannot, in that contract, I, which I is negotiating I mean, between this, the parties. This is really the, where the kernel is, is that the, what the bill will say is that you can, you can still have the closed contract, but you, if you do, you cannot force the individuals who, as an individual, I, I choose to associate and make my own contracts. You cannot force an individual into Actually, you know, now I think about it, John, I mean, the, the, the freedom of association isn't even an issue here because as we, we were talking earlier, we heard is you don't have to join. The Beck decision says you don't have to join. You can say, I don't want to be a member of this union and I want a refund for anything that wasn't uh, used uh, for a core function in that, in that shop. So uh, really the freedom of association is taken care of, isn't it, by the Beck decision in the U.S. Supreme Court? No, because, the, because that... What that decision did is it is it still forces members to enter into to have to pay association fees. Um, but it, the point of that is to prevent that freeloader problem. But you know we can probably go around in circles. I thank you for the inquiry though. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I too found the statistics you presented interesting, um, and I think your your language was extremely careful. Um, let me go back and just revisit this before we get off quickly. Tell me again, what gives you or any government, where in the Constitution can I find that that gives you the right? Well, let me, let me go back this way. The statistics that you, you, you pointed out, I don't need to see any kind of statistics or any kind of study or anything else. I think most Missourians probably don't need to either to know that union workers tend to make more than non union workers. That tells me one thing that collective bargaining is more effective than individual bargaining. So I'll go back to the conscious question. I think, of, of, I think you make a good point. I, I do think that, here's, here's what my, when I look at the data, here's what I think happens. Because what's clear is that the states that are under, that are, that are non-free to work, <laughs> that, that in early times that the, the, the pay increases, but over time, the pay, the pay increases stagnate. And the, the best example I can give is that, I don't know, have you ever, have you ever gone skydiving? No, sir. If, when, you're, when you're skydiving, or if you're under a parachute, which, as you get close to the ground, you want to pull those cords because it, it causes the parachute to, pull, to capture more air quickly. And, and it slows you down. No, I don't know where you're going. That's, here's what I'm saying. So, but, but, no, 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 no. hold on, let me, the question here. Let, me, let me finish the question. The end you, result. You need the answer, sir. The end result. My job is, is to question, and that. your job is to answer. So, what I'm asking is we're in a dialogue. Where, where in the Constitution do you find the right of this government to take away what we have already said now is my most effective tool to bargain my own wages? Where is that found in the Constitution? That in the Missouri Constitution, we give the right of an individual to choose. 
with whom they are going to associate or not to associate. Yeah, and you don't believe that, that the Beck decision has any effect upon, on, that, on that constitutionality whatsoever? The, on your argument, anyway. The Beck decision doesn't, but the but other decisions do. And what we are doing, and the other decisions do give our state the rights to be able to um, create laws that allow for individuals to um, to choose to opt out. Yeah, we, we clearly know, I mean, without looking at any study, without looking at any statistics, that, that union workers tend to make more than non-union workers. So all I see this as, you're taking away my most effective tool to barter my own wages, and I'm a little bit offended by it. Secondly, people are talking about the freeloader thing, and let me give you a, a little bit of analogy here if I can. And that's, uh, I don't know, where, where you're from, gentlemen, I'm sorry? From Springfield. Springfield. So I, I live in, in northwest Jefferson County, and we tend to have an awful lot of private subdivisions in, in my neck of the woods. Do, do, you, do you have the same thing where you live? Yes. Okay. And in those private subdivisions, we have um, private roads. And the homes within those subdivisions pay road dues. And when you buy the home, you are required to sign on to the road dues. And this is, a, I think, a pretty profound analogy here. So if we went ahead and with your type of logic here and said, all you guys that pay road dues, no longer, you don't have to pay them. We can't force you to pay those. What's going to happen to the condition of the roads? Really, you have no idea? The, the roads may, may decline. You think so? And, and yeah. so when I asked you on, on another bill, I'm, I'm going for a little bit of flexibility here. On another bill, if you had, a, as you, you share the goal of decimating labor unions and you replied no, do you still keep that statement? I, I, I look at the associations that exist today, mm -hmm. including many that come through this building, and they are not decimated associations. They are, they are reactive to their members, which associations are you talking about? I'm sorry. I, I would say many. The, the, the medical association. Are these being affected by, by the legislation we're talking about right now? They do not require okay, members so that, of the association. What I'm saying is, is just as those roads would surely deteriorate if we made, made the right to work law within my subdivision and said, you don't pay roads if you don't want to. You can freeload. I tell you, my neighbor, if I watch him, he's not paying dues. He's driving the same roads I'm driving on. I'm paying full dues. If you have a couple of years, I feel like I'm going, why am I paying my dues over here? He gets side drivers in the roads. You know, and any person with common sense knows, that the condition of those roads will deteriorate, and eventually there will be no roads. And I had asked you before for an honest answer of, do you share the goal of decimating labor units in this state? And you said no. And that is surely exactly what will happen should your bill become law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative White, uh, to inquire, go ahead. Uh, Representative, uh, Following on the last conversation about decimating uh, unions, uh, are you aware that Oklahoma has become a right to work state? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and according to the Labor Statistics, at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, their union membership from December 2011 to 2012 increased 21,000 people. Are you aware of what Missouri's union population did in that same time frame? It declined about 13,000. So I think that kind of shoots a little hole that there are at least some examples where indeed a freedom to work is not an anti-union measure. Why, why do you think that, that Missouri declined? Well, I think, one, well, all these states are facing a problem with, with our economics. We've had that for years, but you have a state that, among other things, tax reforms, things, has a freedom to work. It's in creating jobs, and in these jobs, unions have a definite place. This, in my opinion, I agree with you, this allows a union, a local union, to take more control of their local shop. It allows them, if, if you have a non-responsive organization, a, a, a leadership, a steward, that is not responding to you, it's much easier if you have local control to say, hey, you know, you guys are just not fitting the bill. We're going to go and affiliate with a different union. You got you, you know, your leadership has not done what we need. You're not taking care of us what we want. We are going to move if you don't change your policies. Uh, it gives a flexibility to local associations to do that move. <coughs> the comment we just had about in, encroaching on my freedom to or a, a, a union member's freedom to contract. Uh, well, what you're arguing, what I read this as, if, if, tell me if I'm correct. This is, you know, this is association isn't just for the 51% of the people that voted to go into the union. Everybody has the right. It, it bothers me that we have a scenario where we have to pay 
hard-earned taxpayer earned dollars to go to, to work where I want to be able to work in a profession that I choose to work in. Uh, the freeloading argument, uh, I disagree with uh, some of the other attorneys in the room. I'm an attorney. Uh, in briefs filed with the Labor Board by the uh, United Steel Workers and signed by several of the other AFL-CIO people, this, one of them is in 2007, they acknowledge and the labor laws do not require there's an option. The unions can only represent those people that are their members. So this whole thing that you absolutely must represent is not correct. You know, and it's it's in their briefs that they acknowledge that fact. And it's been when you had well, if you had the opportunity, if, I think this, you know, if you had, if you were an association, you had the opportunity to force well, dues. You're going to take that opportunity. Well, and it, that to me is just as the union members in this room want the right to have a union to represent them, I may want the right if I were their fellow worker say, okay, I think, you know, I'm a really good electrician. I'm a really good whatever I am. I want, I, these guys aren't really representing me and my interests. I want to be able to negotiate for myself. Representative or White, would you please use your mic? Oh, There's sorry. Some can't hear you. Excuse me. Oh, well, I've never been told I'm not loud enough. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, nope. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Uh, you know, it, it is, the association is for all workers. I mean, you know, this bill, uh, which I have similar one of, it does not restrict a union. It does not restrict you as a union member from joining, from supporting, from talking to everybody else at your shop and saying, hey, we're, these guys are doing a good job. You need to be part of us and support. But on the, if I don't want to have to pay an association due, I want to be able to negotiate my own terms, or else I, if, I can't, if I don't pay that, I can't work there. That is, a, that is the big association issue to me. That, that's getting down to economics of me supporting my family, my children, and putting me out of a profession potentially, depending on the size of your town. If, if, if I'm a painter and this is the only really painting option in my town, what am I supposed to do? I have to move. So I, 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 I appreciate your association argument on both sides that definitely people need the, associate, the ability to associate with form unions, deal with safety issues, deal with pay issues, but you also should not be compelled, as, as some of the founding fathers of the AFL-CIO agreed, that you should not, you know, one of them made a comment, force, uh, force unionism will be the end, potentially, of the scenario. So I support, I understand, and I, I like to clarify a little bit and support some of your testimony. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Hampton. To inquire. Go ahead. Thank you. Gentlemen, our, our latest census figures show that in the last 10 years, we grew at a small rate of 5% for 10 years here in the state of Missouri. And I believe, as you alluded to earlier in the testimony itself, because of slow growth here in the state itself, we even lost a congressperson. We went down from 9 to 8. Is that accurate? Yes. Gentlemen, do you see any correlation in the growth rate? Yeah, there, there's, I don't have them with me, but I can try to get those to the committee. What's the most stark numbers is the, is, uh, the movement of, of the younger workers, um, that where there's jobs available, the youth, people that are coming to this state, we're, you know, we're, we're helping to fund college MU, Missouri State, other universities around the state, and and then when they come out and they're looking for a job, they're they're not available here as they are in other states, and so that's really the unfortunate thing is that we're seeing the statistics are showing that we're seeing a flight of the younger workers. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To inquire briefly. Good morning, Representative. Good morning. Technology is wonderful, isn't it? Earlier, you were asked about the Oklahoma statistics, and you didn't bring them, is that right? Right. But it's amazing what we can just look up with Google. I Google these up. Solves, solves a lot of conflict. It, it does. Wikipedia, Google, anything. Fortunately, it, it cuts down on the amount of arguing you can do because you can just cut right to the, the true objective statistics. So I just Googled Oklahoma right to work effect just to see what came up. Are you aware that from 2003 to 2010 in Oklahoma, real private sector compensation 
went up 3.4 percent, or I'm sorry, it went up three and a half times the national average, which was 3.4 percent. Wow. So the impact on Oklahoma seems to be, at least in, in the area of private sector compensation, pretty good. If you look at the U.S. Labor Department statistics from 2003 to 2010, private sector employment increased 3.2 percent at the same time, while nationwide it fell 1 percent. So again, I, you know, I'm sure we can all pull out statistics, and I'm sure you didn't bring statistics for every state. But the amazing thing is that even even the states that that you know we don't have any statistics for Indiana, we don't have statistics for Michigan. They're, they're too recent. But the the state that that most recently passed right to work, where there's actually some good solid statistics online, it's been great. And, and I, I I commend you on your bill because my concern is that with with the impact on Oklahoma, particularly being from Southwest as you are, that we're going to lose those jobs to that state. Well, we're watching their wages go up and their employment grow up, and ours is going down. And we're we're cornered by by two states that are, that are uh, freedom to work states. Thank you. Representative Hummel, I believe you'd like to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To acquire. We do. Thank you. Yeah, we got that cleared up. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of brief, uh, brief things. Do you uh, have you ever been a union member yourself? No, I have not. No. Okay. Have you? Uh, where, where did this legislation come from? This um, legislation was. Uh, <laughs> was the same legislation that um, Senator Mayer filed last year. And who asked you to file this bill? I filed it. Right. I decided to file it. You decided to file it. but uh, And so it's not from one of your constituents or anything like that? I think you're, I, I have a constituent of mine that's actually here today. Yeah. He did not ask me to file the bill, but, and I actually. Do you have a lot of union I members? Do you have a lot of union that. members in your district, gentlemen? Um, we don't have, I don't think, as many as you have in your district. Probably, probably not. Um, but in, in my area, I'll tell you, that I'll, if, if you let me entertain, um, I'll give you some of the, can I give you personal stories of what I've experienced in Springfield? Is that growing up in Springfield, we have seen a loss of industries move out. Um, we saw Zenith leave. Um, recently, we saw uh, what used to be called Lily Tulip, and then more recently called Solo Cup leave Springfield. I haven't uh, seen a Zenith television in a long time. Right. <laughs> But they left, uh, Solo Cup left to a freedom to work state. And uh, my how many, uncle, how many jobs did that employ? My, my uncle was one of those um, employees that lost his job. Um, it, they, it was uh, originally at one point there were thousands of employees that worked in there. And the company decided over time that they were, that they were no longer going to invest in that location. And they, for many years, and it was always in the press, were trying to work, or, you know, trying to work with the the labor union in, in the in the in the city and eventually they decided that they were they were just going to completely close that location gentlemen so you so, would say that that this is a disadvantage and that businesses are leaving because of it that's exactly what we've seen firsthand gentlemen are you aware of uh companies such as let's say express scripts are you familiar with the company of express scripts yes are you familiar with how many employees they have brought into this state recent years. They've brought a lot of employees. Five, over 5,000, yeah. gentlemen. Um, over 5,000. In fact, they've moved from other states and consolidated into St. Louis <coughs> in a uh, non-right-to-work state. What do you think the reason for that is? You know, I'm, I'm sure you have a reason. I, I'm, I'm asking you. I mean, you're telling us that we can't attract businesses and businesses are leaving. I'm giving you an example of a company that pays very high wages and benefits has over 5,000 employees, have built multi-million dollar business, and are growing their their company here. I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, you, you're, you're throwing these examples, those plants that have left because of this, and I'm giving you an example of a company that's come into Missouri, one of our leading employers in the state. And so, I mean, maybe you should call them and tell them, I think you probably are going to be wanting to leave soon because we don't have this right to work asked here. But I mean, maybe that's a conversation you could have with some of those, uh, some of those groups. I know that there's groups such as uh, like Anheuser Busch, Boeing. Um, I think Boeing is often in the news about those, some of those decisions. Sure, sure. They they moved the plant to South Carolina, isn't that right? Yeah. I, they had several billion dollars worth of incentives, though, didn't they, gentlemen, to move there? I don't know that we can afford to do that. That's right. That's that's true. So. 
I would assume that, uh, that probably it's not an issue that they move for a right to work, but they also probably move for about $7 billion in incentives. Gentlemen, let me let me ask you let me ask you this. Are you, the, did you get elected unanimously data, in your district? Some of the some of the data. Gentlemen, I, I excuse me. Did you get elected unanimously in your district? Um, by pretty good margin, but not unanimously. Right. So those people that didn't vote for you, do they still have to pay taxes to pay your salary? <laughs> Or can they just choose not to because they don't and, agree with it? And I, the, the good Thank thing you, is gentlemen. that we're all... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Due to our session starting at 10 a.m., I'm going to need to limit the time for testimony for those for and against this bill this morning. And if additional time is needed to hear testimony, I'll recess and then reconvene this afternoon at 2.30. Um, are those here who wish to testify for this bill? The first person, please come forward. I have a Greg Johns on the list. intention is to hear uh, about 30, 40 minutes of support, 30, 40 minutes of oppose, and we'll recess and hear the rest of the testimony this afternoon. Thank you, Yes, my name is Greg Johns. I'm with Missourians for Right to Work, and uh, I guess I'll just leave the witness form up here. I'm here to testify for this bill, except the last part of it. I just, not supporting, that's putting it on the ballot. My idea is to support is for statute, not for on the ballot. Uh, we've got witnesses. I've got my friend Mark Mix from National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation, so I'm going to leave a lot of those questions to him. Uh, I've been with Missourians for Right to Work for quite a few years. Uh, before that, I was an organizer for the AFL CIO in California and Arizona right to work and non right to work states. I organized contracts with Pepsi Cola, Coca Cola, Seven Up, et cetera, et cetera, down in the in beverage workers in California, in California and Arizona. So I'm very familiar with the uh, things that we're doing here. One was question was said about uh, if you put a right to work law in this state it's gonna destroy unions. Well we already have a right to work law in the state, don't we? Public employees? 100,000 members in a right-to-work state are paying dues in Missouri. Missouri has 11.1% is unionized in our state, according to the last figures I have, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 7% is private and 4% is public. And I can go through all kinds of situations of other states. Kansas is thriving very well with unions. Um, Iowa, right to work. We got 11% here, they got 10.6% of union members. And we also have in Missouri, uh, those union members that are being represented in contracts where they don't have forced unionism clause, we have 42,000 members of unions aren't paying dues. All right, so the thing is functioning. My problem is, as an organizer, I was always for the people. Old Marine, Jarhead, love the Constitution. The people need to run their own unions. In California, when we organized there, we put together unions, and uh, of course, they, we got the union security clause and the check off dues, and you business agents know, because I was one, it's a hell of a thing to go through when you don't have a check off dues, because you got to go out and see each person individually get the dues and what are they going to ask you? What have you done for me this month? Even if you've done good things, you know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a business agent, you guys know that's not good. So we certainly try to get checkoff dues. 
But in Arizona, we do not get union security, they call it, or I call it now forced unionism. So I had to deal with that, but we still got checkoff dues. Now, I've worked with the beverage in California and Arizona. Our unions in Arizona paid more money. They made more money in those states than they did in California. In fact, in Arizona, if I didn't do my job as a business agent, a lot of guys said, hey, I got a grievance here, file this grievance, and I didn't, you know, I get busy doing something else in both states. And I come back, they said, hey, Johns, what's the deal on this? He said, we're just, 20 of us are just going to leave the union because you're not doing anything for us. You're not giving us any value for our dollars. So I got to, <coughs> I'd really have to get in there and get something done to protect the money that's coming in to pay my salary. This is, this is important to understand these things. This is basic down to the business agents and the union members. But the union members controlled their unions. They, they would ask me to do things, do this, do that. And sometimes we had situations where they didn't like the AFL-CIO and they certified and went in, became an independent union of themselves, a company union. And they did very well. And I even helped some of those guys do that, negotiate. And I'm, here in Missouri, I'll just tell you an instance we had quite a few times, I'm not going to tell you what companies. The unions went in, won the election, went in and negotiated and couldn't get forced union dues. They couldn't get checkoff dues. And what they did is they walked away from the negotiating table and didn't come back because they didn't get those two things. They were more concerned about getting the money than they were the workers. And this has happened in Missouri. I, we got a Time is running out, so I just need to stop here. Any questions? Representative May? Go ahead. You talk about all the, uh, that you were, you know, a labor person and everything, but tell me about the companies and their treatment of the workers. Why did workers want to organize in the first place? Which companies? All of them. I mean, the companies that you work for. Why is it, why did, you know, you say, you, you talk about unions and unions are more interested in the money than the workers. And you said that... They just walked away is what they did. They didn't come back. Okay, but you said that workers wanted to... People should run their own unions, but workers are running the unions. The people that work for the company are the ones that run the union. So the unions are not run by the business agents, the internationals, and state unions? I mean, everything, just like a corporation, has an organizational structure. So even though we, the people, are running our union, of course we have an organizational structure, just like every other corporation or every other entity. In forced union states, the workers are not running the unions. I mean, I'm a part of a union, and I work for a large company, and the workers are running the union. Well, I'm glad you are, but a lot of them are. And I'll give you the example here uh, out by Deveda. Uh, there is a union, and the guy that works there has to drive an hour and a half go to his work, and the same union has a guy coming into this area driving about an hour to come in. So the guy went to the business agent and says, this doesn't make sense, I'm driving an hour and a half, and another guy's driving an hour to get in, and we both do the same job, I can do it here in this town. And they wouldn't do it. You know what the answer was? If you don't like it, quit. But those are, you're saying these are isolated situations, so let me ask you this so question again. These are your why did, why Look at the history of unions. Why did workers have to organize? The history. Why did workers have to organize? If everything is so peachy cream and the companies are treating the workers right and safety standards no, and all of that are in place, no, just, why do workers have to organize in the first place? The places where unions organize are because the unions are being treated, not the unions, but the employees are being treated bad and so they go look for some help. So people come together. We say, well, I can't do it individually. I can't organize with a big corporation. I can't fight a big corporation by myself. Well, let's keep going on now. All right. I got a company, and I've done this. Uh, I worked for an organization. I became a shop steward. All right. We, we were not getting what we wanted, so we got organized, and we won as a union the election. All right. So we, then we asked for certain things to happen and everything else. And then all of a sudden they, not us, but a, a union person came in and negotiated our contract. And we wanted to be part of that and we didn't get to go in and negotiate with them. And all of a sudden they're negotiating union security agreements. They're negotiating checkoff dues, which we as the members did not want. 
but you have a right to vote for the ratification of the contract. If you don't like the contract, vote it down. I'm not going to get into that. Okay. <laughs> because no, because, I, because, no, no, no. Because, because the majority of the people have to agree to the contract. We're in contract negotiations right now. The contract that, that was negotiated, the people voted it down. So now they're at the negotiation table again. So don't, I mean, I'm in unions. No, no, no. It's, it's those that come to the meeting, majority, are the ones that vote in the contract. No, every employer has to get a vote and get the ballot election. I'm on the election saying everybody gets an election ballot. I'm talking about negotiations, if we, if we want the contract or not. We have a we have a meeting, wherever we meet, a union hall or whatever. All right, you guys, this is what the contract is. We go over it, go over it. All right, let's have a vote here. How many of you want the contract? No, that's not how it's done. It's legally. Gee, all these years I've been in, we don't do it that way. No, because if you're doing it that way, it's illegal. Because legally, you have to be able to, people have to cast their ballot, just like in a regular election. You have to count those ballots. You have to have a trail and everything. Legally, it is not done by voice folks, not that I'm aware of. If you're doing it that way, it's illegal. Are you talking about negotiating the contract and agreeing on the contract? Are you talking about an election? I'm talking about negotiating and agreeing on the contract. The contract has to be voted on. And then when everybody puts in what they want, right, it's those that are there at the meeting. So you're saying that then they have to go out? It's not those that are there at the meeting. The ballots are mailed to everybody. Well, man, now I guess the, the AFL-CIO and all the guys I work with are doing it wrong then. I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> they were. Uh, next witness, please, Mr. Mix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. My name is Mark Mix, and I'm the president of the National Right to Work Committee located in Springfield, Virginia. We are a 2.8 million member organization that believes that every worker should have the right to join a union, but no one should be compelled as a condition of employment to pay dues or fees to get or keep a job. I have written testimony here that I'll submit with my witness sheet, but I wanted to address some of the issues that have come up in the questioning and just get to kind of the nub of the issue. Uh, this bill, HB 77, does not deny any individual the right to join. Does not deny any individual the right to join a union. Nor does it deny any individual to bargain collectively. Nor does it deny any individual to pay union dues if they want to. Everybody here today, it's a great showing for organized labor. They're all voluntary members of the union. You're a voluntary member of the union, madam, and, and I know that you're here because you support the work that they do. But there may be those workers that don't want to be part of a union. And so their associational rights are violated by a federal labor policy passed in the New Deal that I want to address a little bit because of some of the questions over here. First of all, the duty of exclusive representation. Unions do not have to bargain for everyone in the bargaining unit. Representative White referenced a, a brief filed by the AFL-CIO in front of the National Labor Relations Board on rulemaking. I'll read from page 19 of this. This is the AFL-CIO's brief. It says, nevertheless, as Congress intended, and as statutory text indicates, neither Section 885 nor Section 9A confines the employer's bargaining obligations to majority exclusive representation only. It talks about the idea that union officials get to make the choice if they want to negotiate an exclusive bargaining contract. If they want to, and it's agreed to in the contract, then the union official has an obligation to represent everyone in the workplace. But there is something we need to understand first. This duty was created by a Supreme Court case in 1944 called Louisville Railroad versus Steel. And what happened was a railway union had gotten the right to exclusively bargain for every <coughs> railway worker in the unit. There were five black workers who the union decided they did not want to represent. These black, black workers brought a grievance saying, we can't represent ourselves, we can't go to the employer and negotiate our own contract because the contract had exclusivity. The Supreme Court ruled that if union officials are going to ask for exclusivity in the law, meaning be the sole bargaining voice in a bargaining unit, then they had a duty to represent all of those workers. They couldn't pick and choose who they were going to represent because the Congress gave them the ability to be the sole voice in a workplace. So in 1944, the Supreme Court said, yeah, we went a little too far in 1935 with the Wagner Act, giving these union officials this power of exclusive bargaining if they choose so. And if they get it, they now have the duty to represent everyone in the workplace. I think it's important we do that. I would be glad to file this in the record, sir, this brief by the AFL-CIO laying out that particular legal obligation, the lack of a legal obligation to require exclusivity. 
The brief comes out of a, a rulemaking process where the unions are arguing for minority-only unions. They're saying, we believe we can represent a small group of workers in this workplace, and they're arguing for that based on the text of the Wagner Act from 1935. So let's dispose of that notion. They don't have to have asked for exclusivity in the contract. The reason why they ask for exclusivity is because it's the only compelling way they can force a worker to pay fees to get or keep a job. Because once they take away a worker's right to speak for themselves, once they take away that right, that worker has no choice but to accept the representation of that union. You know, in common law, we have elements of a contract. We have consideration, a meeting of the minds, and no duress. In labor law, we have duress. We have, there, you would argue, some would argue there's consideration because the worker does labor under a contract negotiated that, quote, benefits him or may not benefit him. If he's the best lathe operator or she's the best lathe operator, it may not benefit her because her wages are set, structured by step, and there can be no reward for her merit in the workplace. So the idea that, that a worker is somehow a free rider is really just a, a, a notion of rhetoric. They're actually captive passengers. And so we talk about the voting of the contract. When a worker actually exercised their rights under the Beck decision, which was brought up here, this was a case litigated by the National Rights Work Legal Defense Foundation, it took 13 years to get to the U.S. Supreme Court, and a telephone lineman, a member of the Communication Workers of America, found out that his money was being spent for things he disagreed with, and it didn't relate to the core functions as mentioned by the representative here. He said he wanted out. And the U.S. Supreme Court said he did have rights, and he couldn't be compelled to pay for causes, ideological causes, and political causes, which he didn't support but he could still be forced to pay fees to get or keep his job. But in order to exercise his Beck rights, he has to give up his workplace rights. And every union official in the room here, shop steward and union member will recognize this, that in order to exercise that right, you must resign from the union. And if you resign from the union, you can't vote on your contract, you can't vote in union elections, you can't participate in any union committees. So in order to hold your, your ideological or political or whatever rights you're trying to defend, your religious rights, whatever they are, you have to give up your workplace rights to exercise that right. That's no choice for an individual. That's no choice for association. And that's the wrong choice. As I mentioned, this bill would not deny anyone the right to join a union. Representative White talked about some unionization numbers in, in various states. And eight of the, of the 24 right, actually the 22 right to work states in 2000 and before 2012 actually had increases in union density. Eight. I mean, how does that happen? How does that happen? We talked a little bit about the free rider argument. We, we talked about that. Uh, you know, the idea that you don't have to join the union, the Freedom Association, we address that. The voting rights of an individual <coughs> worker on a contract, we talked about that. As far as job growth, let's talk about that for a minute. From January of 2011, someone mentioned Oklahoma. Uh, since January of 2011, 51,000 new jobs, I believe, have been created in Oklahoma, 13,000 in the manufacturing sector. In Indiana, the Indiana Economic Development Department just released statistics to talk about 94 deals that have come to them since right to work passed. 64 in the pipeline, 39 have been consummated, 4,500 new jobs, $1.6 billion in new investment. Those are the things we're talking about. The right to work law here that Missouri can pass and become the 21st right, 25th right to work state would de not deny any worker the right to join a union, to bargain collectively, or to pay union dues. It simply gives the individual the choice. That's what this is about. I'd be glad to take any questions. Just to inquire briefly. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, I, I'm sorry I didn't under, I, I don't think I heard it. What organization are you with? I'm with the National Right to Work Committee. And is that located in Missouri? No, we're, we're in Springfield, Virginia. So Springfield, so you traveled here just for this hearing? I did. Well, thank you for coming. My pleasure, thank you. And, and, <laughs> and uh, now who in your organization, um, I guess how, Tell me a little bit about your organization. Is it it's a nationwide yes. movement? Yeah. We were founded in 1955 when five railway workers came together after 1951. They were compelled to pay dues to the union to keep their jobs. And so they came together with five... So are those five members, are they still members of your union? No, they're... Or your, they your organization? Along. Okay, so who funds your organization today? We are funded completely by voluntary contributions. Today, uh, we have about 137,000 people that have given us an average contribution of about $54. Are those corporations as people, or are they Absolutely actually not. people? The biggest corporations in America oppose right to work vehemently. So they do not support it. They lobby against it. In fact, they, they are very comfortable with the notion that they can take every single employee in a unit every three years, not have to worry about who's the good ones, who the bad ones are, who the mediums are, and they can set a contract 
that basically says everybody adheres to this. So corporate America is against this bill? I would say that, that uh, GM, Ford, Chrysler, uh, even Boeing, I think, is against right to work. So the decision makers in a lot of our major corporations in Missouri are actually against this. Yes, yeah, because they're against the worker. So that's right. Well, I mean, I think we have probably. I'll, I'll let some others talk. <laughs> What's so funny about that? But, you don't. Is GM for the worker? For the price? Well? Yeah. No. The, Excuse me. I'm sorry. Well, the, the the reason for my question is is, you know, I appreciate you coming down here and telling us what's good for Missouri, but. You know, Simi is someone who's not from Missouri and actually doesn't know, maybe, or purports to say that what Missouri companies want or don't want, it just is a little bit concerning, you know, as to whether or not, um, you know, we should be passing legislation based on that. I appreciate that. And I, and I trust that you don't use any information from outside of Missouri to make in, in decisions uh, that you make here in the legislature. No, but I, I do I do listen to, to our major employers and, and our workers. I'm sure we'll hear from them today. So thank you for, for coming up. My pleasure. Representative May? Permission to inquire. Go ahead. Isn't this a nationwide agenda to reduce the voice of the middle class to create poverty because you know just like he can google he googles statistics for Oklahoma when I google statistics for Oklahoma and it's a whole bunch of whole bunch of people that do the statistics you know different agencies it says that the manufacturing shrink in Oklahoma their the cost their uh, the pay scale for workers shrink so I don't know which study he's looking at but you have varying studies so we can concede to say that we all can see studies that benefit us and we can see studies that don't benefit us. Just like, you know, people read the Bible. They'll see things for them and they'll see things against. So my question to you is, this seems like to me, this right to work issue lowers the wages of people that are in the middle class. And it seems to me that it's here to create a third world condition for people. Because as people's wages are going down, the cost of living is not going down. And so we're decreasing the buying power of the poor and the middle class. So are you aware of this? Because every state that I look at, you're talking about the 24 states, when we pull this up, 10 of those states in this study show that salaries have decreased in that state. And jobs are not what you claim they are. So like I said, studies can show anything. So. Yeah, let me, let me reference a study done by the American Federation of Teachers and affiliated the AFL-CIO. Uh, in 2002, they did research relating to wages for teachers across America. And the AFT did an interesting thing. Their, their researchers there actually decided they were going to adjust for the cost of living. So they put together a cost of living index to adjudicate the fair rate of purchasing power disposable income for their members in all 50 states. And interestingly enough, for the AFT, they found that when they adjusted for cost of living, when you took the Department, the Bureau of Labor Statistics wages for right-to-work states and non-right-to-work states, using the AFT's research model, we found, and they found, and they admit this, that workers in right-to-work states actually have more disposable income than workers in poor states. They don't do this research anymore. But I can read a quote from, from those professors. Um, when we, when we use this study, we use their matrix for developing this cost of living analysis and these wages, they said the AFT survey, and I quote, the AFT survey and analysis of salary trends shows that employees in right to work states enjoy lower living expenses and that after adjusting for differences in living costs, the real earnings are higher in right to work. So you're saying that the cost of living in right to work state goes down? Is lower. The no, the cost of living is lower. It doesn't go down, it's just lower. Uh, That's so, what their research shows. So, so, so the idea. So we're saying that we're lowering our standards of living when we get to the right to work. That's what we're no, trying no, to do. No, you're not doing that. I, that no, uh, that doesn't. I don't think that flows from. What Let we're me doing. ask you another question. Let me ask you. Have all the data and statistics there. So you know, I asked the question of the bill sponsor, and I'm interested in knowing this question because I mean, it is definitely key. And I've researched this, but I've you know I've looked at these statistics years ago when this was an issue. So my question is, what about the disparity in the right to work states between the salaries of African Americans and whites and the salaries of women and men? Do you have those statistics? I, I do not, but I would ask you this, in a, in a collectively bargaining agreement, would there be a disparity between women and men? It would not. It would not, that's right, so there is not. 
Um, I think the U.S. Congress addressed that issue back in the beginning of 2010 with, uh, I forget the name of the legislation, but they addressed that issue. But no, right to work doesn't deal with the issue of wages. If you look at the bill, look at the language of the bill, again, I would ask you, if you pass this bill, does it deny anyone the right to join a union? If you pass this bill, this bill HB 77. Well, it, it, it's not, I'm, I mean, on that question, what it's doing is, is allowing people the benefit of services, you understand, without paying their fair share. And I'll go back to the gentleman's example. Because, I mean, I lived in an association where, I, I mean, I wanted to buy that house on that block. But in order for me to buy that house on that block, they told me I had to pay these association fees. Why should I have to do that? In America, we should be able to buy a house where we want to buy a house at. But so, you know, when you go there, when you go there, that means that since I want to live in this area, I got to pay the benefit of this area. I got to pay for the luxury of living in this certain area. It's the same thing. You have to pay your fair share when you have the luxury of this benefit package that's been negotiated for you on your behalf. That's, you know, that's what I think. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I, can I, can I address that issue? Well, I, the idea of association in the workplace. Remember, the worker doesn't get the choice to negotiate his own contract under an exclusive bargaining provision. He does not. He has to give up, in order to exercise one set of rights, he has to give up another. So let's, let's recognize the inherent problem or Hobson's choice that a worker faces under monopoly bargaining. When he the came there, he had the choice. When he came to that employment, the salaries and benefits had already been negotiated. So if he, if they had already been negotiated, so he's walking into something that was done before he got there. And then later on, he's still benefiting from that negotiation because those salaries and those increases and those profit sharing that's been negotiated between the company and the workers, the majority of the workers wanted to negotiate collectively to get the most in their collective bargain. So that person, regardless if he chooses to give up his rights or not, are still benefiting from the umbrella of so those benefits. So he would have to quit his job. He wouldn't be able to I mean it's just that. like that. Well I won't have to move into the association. <laughs> I can't move into that. But in situation. the course in the course of what where you are with that, let's I, include everything then. Don't just include unions. If we're talking about contracts here, let's include all these contracts. I shouldn't have had to sign a contract to pay the association dues. Let's include all contracts if that's what we're talking about. Because you're specifically focusing on labor unions, but you have other contracts that do the same thing. Let's include elections per se. I wasn't elected 100% of my district, but those people have to pay taxes. Let's stop them from paying taxes since they didn't elect me. Well, let's, let's like talk that. about the difference between, between a private organization and government. Oftentimes, union officials use that government. They use that argument about taxes. You've got to pay taxes. We government. as citizens in this experiment in individual freedom have given our right to the government. Thank you. They are the one institution that can exercise that force. All right. How about our next witness, please, Mr. Hoberuck. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to address this uh, committee and uh, the chairman. Um, my name is Greg Holbrock. I am a resident of the state of Missouri. I live in Missouri. I was born and raised in Missouri. I spent a very short period of time outside of Missouri in Cincinnati, Ohio for two years. I come from southwest Missouri, down around Neosho, Missouri. Uh, I currently own HTH companies and several other businesses in the state of Missouri. We work throughout the Midwest, uh, six or seven states. I'm a member of Associate Builders and Contractors. I am their past chairman and they've asked me to come down here and speak. Incidentally, I am the current national chairman of Associated Builders and Contractors. We represent 19,000 construction companies across the country and represent those companies employ some 3 million workers across the country. I'm here to offer my personal support and support of our association for this bill. I've heard all the testimony before. I've heard it over in the Senate. I have never spoken on the subject before, and I'm not going to cite statistics because, as Representative May pointed out, uh, anybody can uh, deliver any sort of study to say whatever they want. First thing I read, I look for when I'm reading a study is, who paid for it? If you tell me who paid for it, I can tell you what the study says. Uh, it's pretty that simple. So let's just talk about some things I've heard and, and apply some good old Missouri common sense to the issue. Economic development. I hear uh, the union side say that it has no impact on economic development. 
I hear those in favor of right to work say there are businesses across the state, across this country, that will not look at Missouri because they are not right to work. Okay. I don't know whether I believe it or not. I don't know. I've never heard it. Here's what I do know. I've never heard those who represent a union stand up and testify that businesses will not come to a state because they are right to work. I've never heard anybody claim that. So somebody's claimed it in all the arguments we've had over it. I assume that not to be a true statement. So, if all things equal, why take the chance? Why take the chance? If you're looking at economic development, take that issue completely off the table because it, it may have an impact positively. We know it doesn't have an impact negatively. Secondly, I hear a lot about fairness. My mama, who just recently died at 101 years old, taught me at a very, very, very young age, life's not fair. It's just that simple, life's not fair. And if you really want to talk about fairness, I should have a right to a job, any job, and not be forced to pay anybody to hold that job, short of the government entities to protect us in the form of taxes. That should be my right. That's fair. If there are members, my co-employees, that want to be represented by unions and want to put their, pool their resources to make their jobs better, and I get a little bit of benefit out, that is their right to do that. I acknowledge their right. I defend their right to do that. Just don't force me to do it. Just don't force me to do it. So if you apply a little bit of Missouri common sense to it, it doesn't seem to me that there's any downside to right to work. I understand people say you have lower wages. Okay, we're, a, we're open shop. Shoot, we're in the construction industry open shop. I see a lot of union members in the construction city sitting out there. I have several of my employees that make six figures. I'm sure there are several members of the construction industry that love to make six figures. Some do, some don't. Good employers pay the cost for good employees. I'm not a history major, but I think we all know that unions came about because, because uh, 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 employers abused employees. I acknowledge that. I'll tell you that straight up. I will tell you that I think the fall of the union membership in the country over the since the 1950s is because power changed a little bit and unions abused management and management said we're done. So I think you need a balance. I don't think this bill exclude union membership, I think it gives the employee the right to make their own choice to further the income and to have a job and do what they want to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Could I please hear the first witness for the opposition, Mr. Mike Lewis. Do you have any questions? Yes, Due to time constraints, if we're going to hear from the opposition, I think we better do so now. We'll be back this afternoon for more questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the KID Committee. My name is Mike Lewis. I'm the, the uh, Secretary Treasurer for the Missouri AFL-CIO. A little background on right to work, right to work laws. There are laws in uh, 25 states, or 24 states, that prohibit workers and employers from negotiating union security clauses which ensure that all workers who receive the economic benefits of contracts that are negotiated <coughs> receive those benefits equally. These laws allow non-members to receive the benefits of a union without sharing the cost if you become a right to work state. In Missouri and in the 25 other states, workers and employers are free to negotiate union security clauses which require all employees in the bargaining unit to either pay dues or a monthly amount that minimally equals the amount needed for their union representation. In 1988, the United States Supreme Court ruled that employees could retain their employment by electing pay, to pay dues or be required to only pay that portion as I mentioned above. Set the record and the name straight, Right to work does not guarantee any rights or any jobs. It weakens unions and it weakens collective bargaining unit. It destroys the best job security protection that exists, a union contract. 
Meanwhile, it allows some workers to pay nothing and receive all the benefits paid for by union membership. Keep in mind the federal labor law ruling of the National Labor Relations Board and decisions by the United States Supreme Court ruling that unions must represent every eligible employee no matter what any union or organization may have written in their brief has not had a, an impact upon these rulings. This forces unions to use their time and their dues paying members money not for themselves but for the freeloaders who are enjoying the benefits provided to them who are not willing to pay their fair share. That's why right to work in Missouri is and always will be a ripoff. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, repeat what you said and what scope of this about unions being required to represent everybody in the bargaining unit. We heard of something from a, a brief in 1944 um, was the argument that they don't have to, but, but you're in this business. They do, don't they? That's correct. And actually, it was overturned to a certain degree in 1988 by a ruling called the Beck Ruling. It says you don't have to belong to the union, but you do have to pay your fair share to enjoy those benefits, up to and including if you are discharged, the union has a duty of fair representation to represent every worker, whether they pay dues or not. Okay, and let's, let's, let's back up and take this to the big picture. From my my perspective, unions have been created because there's, there's a, a difference, there's asymmetric power between an employer and an employee, right? I mean, an employer has, and when we talk about unions, we're talking about larger employers. I mean, the people aren't trying to unionize the shop with two people. Um, they're generally larger, larger employers. <clears throat> they have different resources. They have different negotiating power. There's not even negotiating power between, between the larger company and the individual. That's correct. So the way we, we have decided to balance this is by allowing the employees to join together to try to provide a more level field for collective, for bargaining. Right? That's correct, Representative. Now, for that to work, everybody's got to be involved. I mean, it, it's a logical assumption that if I can get other people to pay for my representation, even if I enjoy that representation, if I can get other people to pay for it without having to pay for myself, I'm not going to. Right? That's right. It's, it's moral hazard. It's the concept of moral hazard. The idea that I can change my behavior. Suddenly, you know, these two guys have to pay, you know, my dinner bill. I'm still going to eat, right? I mean, I, if I get a choice to say, do I want to pay my share or do I want to make them pay, I'm going to make these guys pay. That, that's correct, but if the bill's going to be equal, right. your meal's not going to be as good. <laughs> True. But they, if, the problem is they understand the same thing. And so what happens is everybody makes the rational self-decision to say, you know what, if the union is required by law to represent me, but I'm not required by law to pay dues or pay my fair share of the bargaining rent, I'm not going to do that. But everybody makes that same decision because it's a rational decision for an individual to make. And pretty soon, this idea of coming together collectively, the last one in is holding the bag and paying for the representation of everybody in the bargaining unit, right? And so that's, what happens is it slowly kills the idea of the bargaining unit, and all of a sudden we're not all together bargaining, we're individually bargaining, we're back to that asymmetric power difference. That's correct. And so to me, the key point here is that the union is required by law to represent everybody. And if we don't have everybody on board paying their fair share, then because of moral hazard, the inevitable consequence is free riders who make the rational self-decision that I'm not going to pay for somebody else to represent me when I don't have to. Yeah, my answer to that is absolutely, and I couldn't have said a better representative. Thank you, Jim. I, I, the key point, I think, is that they still have to require to, to represent everybody under federal law so I can get benefits under this bill that I don't pay for. This bill allows me to free ride or freeload on the payment of other, my, my co-employees, and I think that's wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jeff Lucy. Mr. Mr. Chairman, due to uh, someone who's traveling uh, today, could I ask that this gentleman, Mr. Adolphus Pruitt, go before me? Absolutely. Thank you, sir.
My name is Adolphus M. Pruitt the second. I reside in the city of St. Louis. I am the president of the St. Louis branch of the NAACP. I also chair economic empowerment for the Missouri State Conference of the NAACP. And I'm here today on behalf of my state president, Mary Ratliff, to speak in opposition of uh, the bill. Um, you know, Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, I'm known as a pretty straight shooter. It would be a little bit in, more interesting dialogue if uh, when people sponsor bills and there are some uh, extenuating issues or circumstances involved that we could get those on the table and that way we really could have a dialogue about the uh, crux of the issue. Um, and I think that just hasn't happened here necessarily today. Uh, but our concern is from a economic standpoint is that um, people are bantering a lot of uh, things and conversations and summations and things of that nature and it's, it's a very dangerous thing to do uh, especially when we're talking about tinkering with uh, the economy of the state of Missouri and the supply of workforce that is the engine uh, for that economy. Um, you know we talk about studies and stuff I would least like to offer one as a resource for you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee that um, our congressional leadership uh, relies on, and it's from the Congressional Research Service. Um, uh, it was dated December the 6th, 2012. It's actually a report on this issue that was put together for the members of Congress and their committee to give them some guidance as it relates to uh, legislation and impact, especially impacting legislation on issues like this. The one thing that uh, I find um, very interesting is that um, I want to read just a couple of quick points that is stated. It says the uh, national right to work proposals are often discussed in the context of economic performance of states that have adopted them. However, research that compares outcomes and work right to work in union security state is inconclusive. Uh, the recent data trends between right to work and union security states are relatively distinct, but the influence of right to work laws in these trends is unclear. Uh, it goes on and says, difficulties associated with rigorous studying, the relationship between right to work laws and the various outcomes are likely to continue to make it difficult, difficult to generate definitive findings about these relationships. As such, the ongoing debate on right to work may be driven by factors other than rigorous empirical evidence. And it's the lack and the absence of that evidence that, uh, as it relates to this bill and any other discussions about right to work that, again, it, it troubles us in this sort of economy, especially when we talk about tinkering with the relationship within the workforce that is the engine of, our, of this state's economy and the corporations who are located here. The other thing, is, and the reason why it's been so difficult is because one thing they won't say, they would banter off about these number of states. <clears throat> and it's so ironic that um, when you look at the dates, the dates in which these states adopted these right to work laws, and, and, you, and, and you look at them, in Florida was in 1943, you got Arizona, Arkansas, Georgia, Iowa, Nebraska, North Carolina, North Dakota, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia. All of those didn't come on until 1947. Then you got Nevada in 51, Alabama in 53, Mississippi and South Carolina in 54, Utah 55, Kansas 58, Wyoming 63. Then we're starting to get into modern, a modern technical society. Louisiana in 76, Idaho in 85, Oklahoma in 2001, and of course Indiana in 2012. But if you look at their range, the majority of them came on in the 40s. So to sit up and say I'm going to compare how those states are performing now economically and to associate however their performance is with them uh, adopting right to work laws in the 40s is ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous especially when we're going to tinker with 
the state's economy and the workforce, which is the engine for it. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I won't take up more time. I would just simply say this, is that our concern is the fact that there is no empirical data. Nobody knows what, what impact this is going to have. I don't know if uh, the uh, sponsor has, I, I have no idea of, of just what the, what the real motivations are, but truly anybody that comes up to you and this committee and testify that there are some studies or there are some data or there is anything that demonstrates that right to work laws are good economically, but state is wrong. It is absolutely wrong, it is absolutely false, and the data does not exist. Uh, I appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Representative White. Uh, brief inquiry. Would by counterpoint then are you are you also then saying seeing the data is the way you think it is, that any evidence, any study that presents that being a non right or being a non right to work state is also of the same questionable caliber? Yeah, I, I, you know, I would agree with that, and, and I would say that in this context is that's why absolutely one way or the other we should not be tinkering with our workforce at this point in time with bills of this nature without empirical evidence, one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Abusi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jeff Abusi. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the St. Louis Building Construction Trades Council, and we represent approximately 40,000 tradesmen and women in the St. Louis region. Um, to get on record, we are opposed to House Bill 77 and its negative impact on Missouri's construction industry. This legislation, we believe, is a harmful piece it is imperative that all our elected officials understand how Missouri's construction trades positively contribute to the economic strength and growth of our state. Construction trades are committed to that economic growth in Missouri, and we're deeply concerned with the negative economic impact this legislation will bring. Currently, the building trades in 2012 has provided four point, I'm sorry, $412 million in pension benefits to its members, which are funded by joint labor and management boards. The trades health and welfare funds provided last year $973 million in health benefits to our members in Missouri, and our trades have invested over $68.5 million in training for not only apprentices, but journeyman upgrades as well for the next generation of highly skilled workers. All these expenditures that we talk about in the hundreds of million dollars of investments have been made without any assistance from the state of Missouri and without any cost to our Missouri taxpayers. Training is the backbone of our construction industry and we pay for it with funding by our members and our contractors. All these funds are jointly managed by both labor and management. These investments are huge economic benefits to the state. In comparison, Missouri's fourth largest public retirement systems have no public infrastructure investments specific in Missouri. Not only that, our pension investments generate millions of man hours of construction specific to Missouri. We continue to leverage our pension assets to help finance projects. We feel that this piece of legislation would definitely damage those opportunities. We have the AFL-CIO Building Investment Trust, the Housing Investment Trust, multi-employer pension tr trusts that have donated, not donated, but financed hundreds of millions of dollars in projects in and around Missouri. But if I could just comment on one statement that Representative May had asked a previous uh, person here. I believe the question was, is it better in right-to-work states for women? And I don't believe that the statistic was brought. But I will let you know that the Bureau of Labor Statistics talk about that, and it, it firmly discusses women workers in union states earn $226 more per week than the non-union women. It says women in right-to-work states earn $5,434 less per year in states where these laws exist. And in relation to the African-American workers, 
African American workers in unions earn 29.6% more each week, which is approximately $176 more than non-union African American workers. Those statistics have been provided by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, just for the record. And I appreciate your time in, in yielding to this gentleman prior to me. Um, Putting forth some testimony sheets, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer them. Thank you, sir. Uh, I might uh, remind all of the witnesses please be sure to fill out it with the sheet. And I think that brings up Mr. Cook. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is David Cook. I'm president of UFCW Local 655. I represent workers in the eastern half of the state, predominantly in grocery stores, but in food processing and manufacturing. Currently, we have approximately 11,000 members. A lot of reasons I would like to testify against this bill today. Uh, and you heard about all the different statistics. One thing I'd talk about is the health care is a proven statistic that the number of workers in right-to-work states that have health care is lower than in states that are not right-to-work. There's a couple other things that, as I've listened today, just sit wrong with me. And to propose this, and I'm not sure what the bill sponsor was calling it, but some type of freedom language or worker freedom or job freedom, the other tagline of right-to-work, to be so disingenuous to use language like that to try to paint a bill that is damaging to workers in a positive light and light sickens me. When I've walked the halls up here the last couple of years and I've asked legislators who are elected by their constituents, are you in favor of right to work? And they say, well, yes. And I say, why? Because everybody ought to have a right to work. When you explain to them what it is, there's a lot of elected officials that don't understand what right to work is or freedom for whatever it is. This just sickens me that we would think about putting a law like this in front of the voters of Missouri and paint it with this false disguise. Let's call it what it is. This is nothing more than a freeloader act. So let's call it what it is. We think that people ought to freeload in the state of Missouri. And if you're in favor of that, vote for this. That'd be more genuine than what you're doing right now. And why we want to pass this bill so terrible in this state of ours is beyond me. We've heard the number that there's 11% of us left. left. There's 11% unionized workers in the state of Missouri. The majority of those unionized workers sit on two areas, the St. Louis metropolitan area and the Kansas City metropolitan area. There are districts in the state of Missouri right now that are represented by representatives that basically have 0 0.01 union membership. I would ask, why isn't business going there now? You can't get less than zero. If you get right to work and union membership drops, how low a membership can you get? In some of your districts where you had, the bill sponsor said he doesn't have much union membership there. If you have 0.1% union membership, how much lower can you get to attract industry? They're not coming to those areas now. What is this going to do to entail them to come there? I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. I'd ask you to still think about the disingenuous manner of how you're presenting this to the voters or proposing to. Representative Kelly? To inquire. Go ahead. Uh, gentlemen, I, my understanding of the bill is they're not concerned about the 0.01%. Companies aren't locating to those areas because they know that once they locate, that number will go from 0.01 to 0.11 or 2.1 or 10.1. The states that have right to work know that their companies are not going to be forced into union contracts. I don't believe that they're concerned about the membership increasing or de decreasing in areas that it's 0 0.01, as you're pointing out. So I think that the concept behind this is not because we're concerned about union membership in these areas. So, so I would ask the respectable representative, what companies in your district have you talked to that said they're not going there? And give me the names, please, that they're not going to go there because they don't want to talk to me later. I would have to inquire of my economic development director. He actually gave the names at a recent meeting where he had three companies that actually had been looking at a couple of facilities that have been opened up in our area, and all of them chose to go to right-to-work states instead. And that's the sole reason? 
That is the only be, reason they gave when they made their the final climate, it's going to be the transportation, it's going to be the infrastructure, it's going to be a multitude of other areas. You know, I heard the, it, I the company's heard. excuse that they gave as we were down to the top three choices was that they were sorry that they weren't able to locate to our facilities, but they were going to go with the right to work option instead. I find that hard to believe because every statistic I've well, you seen, know, I, I've I'm seen sorry that you find it hard to believe, I've but you know, has shown back that is in the top in the bottom ten reasons, not the top ten. Well, with these three companies, it was the number one reason. So maybe it, they don't want to pay their employees decently. Have to ask yourself that. Lindy Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, John. Um, I, I, I was listening to your, your um, testimony on health care, and it was kind of short. A little bit broken. I understand we're trying to get, get through these things here, but you had mentioned that um, health care being provided is at a higher rate in union states than it is in, in right to work states. Am I correct? Absolutely. Uh, I do have some statistics, and I, I probably should have expanded on. You know, I, I told you how many members we have, and, and Brother Abuse, Abuse spoke about the health care benefits they provide. Uh, my organization pays about $72 million annually in health care claims to our members that we represent, proudly represent. But in right to work states, about 16.8% of the population is not covered by insurance. insurance. In, in uh, shops like this, states like this, it's 13.1. So in right to work states, it's 16.8. In non right to work states, it's 13.1. Among children, it's even worth worse. It's 10.8 versus 7.5. And a very concerning issue is in right to work states, the percentage of infant mortality is 15% higher in right to work states. Uh, and one other thing, to, if I could get off just a little bit, is that we keep talking about closed shops and open shops. Just for a point of clarification, closed shops were mandated illegal. <coughs> with Taft-Hartley in 1947. Uh, it's a union shop. Closed shops in the United States are illegal. They are not legal in this state. A closed shop means you have to join the union before you can apply. So just a point there if you read history. I have to tell you, sir, that I actually uh, share your, your offense you take at, at uh, the terms being used for this particular bill and this particular kind of legislation. And it, I think it is completely misleading. I can tell you that I, I sat in on a, um, a chance to interview about 10 candidates running for Congress a, a few years back, and uh, uh, both sides of the aisle here. And uh, when we would ask them, these are candidates for Congress, as to what are your thoughts on right to work, and we got similar kinds of answers from way too many of them. So I, I, I was appalled, and I've, I've been around this thing for a while, completely appalled um, by a number of, of, of that kind of magnitude. Um, the, um, the I heard a couple of, of fellows uh, this week talking in, in the Capitol, and you mentioned health care, and, and it kind of sparked my curiosity because the conversation I heard in the elevator was just too, I'll, I'll admit anonymous, was that maybe union membership, or I'm sorry, the health care would be even greater if they didn't have to pay for the expense of union membership, maybe they go out and buy their own health care. What would you say to something like that? So maybe somebody could go out and get insurance for, let's see, my members' average dues rate in my local union is about $42 a month. So if that's what they're paying and getting a very good health insurance that's a 90-10, then I would welcome them to uh, go to work at Walmart. They're not union, by the way. Uh, they don't have to pay the $42. Uh, I don't think they have similar benefits to what my members do, in all honesty. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Uh, Richard, if you have a short testimony, we'll do it now. If not, we'll wait until this afternoon. I, uh, I've, I've sent up my request. Uh, I'll just read it because I might have to read it again. Sorry. Right ahead. My name is Lawrence Redman. I'm the director of the Missouri Department of Labor and Industrial Relations. And the only thing I want to provide here today is that the, the administration opposes this legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we uh, are going to recess this hearing until 2.30 this afternoon. We'll meet again in this room. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.